So it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you today about two important topics. John Sodder will talk about climate change and I'll talk about stratospheric ozone depletion. Obviously they're very important and we're delighted that they are included in the Leaving Cert um, chemistry syllabus. These talks are going to be posted on our research group webpage. The research group is called Centre for Research into Atmospheric Chemistry, CRAC. Okay, pun is intended. And it's crackucc.ie. So these slides will be available for you to look at and download. Okay. So I'm going to talk about ozone depletion. And it really was, if climate change is the pressing societal issue now, well, stratospheric ozone depletion was the pressing societal issue in the, in the 1980s and even going into the 1990s. What do you know about ozone? Well, it was discovered over 160 years ago by a German scientist who was investigating electrical discharges through air. You can make ozone by passing electrical current through, through oxygen. In the, 1950, in the 1850s, it was shown that ozone was in fact shown to be a natural constituent of the atmosphere. For example, produced through lightning and so on. In 1880, Experiments then show that ozone strongly absorbs ultraviolet radiation that is emitted by the sun. 1913, proof that most of the atmosphere's ozone is located not at ground level, but in the stratosphere, part of the atmosphere which is about 15 to about 40 or 50 kilometers above our heads. And in the 20s, Dobson, a famous Oxford scientist, perfected an instrument to monitor quantitatively total atmospheric ozone, and we've been doing it ever since. So it's almost 100 years that we've been regularly measuring and monitoring ozone in Earth's atmosphere. What do we know about it? Well, at this stage, through lots of investigations, research that has taken place over the last, especially the last 50 years, we know, we know this. This is the profile for ozone in the atmosphere, going up to about 35, 40 kilometers. We know that most of the ozone is actually in the stratosphere. There is also some down at ground level though. And I'll just quickly say a few words about that because it is, an, it is an issue that sometimes people get a little bit confused with. Ozone is also naturally produced at ground level. Okay, it's produced from sunlight breaking down nitrogen dioxide to give us an oxygen atom, which couples with O2 to give you O3. And so ozone is formed at ground level naturally, but when we have extra emissions, for example from vehicles, hydrocarbons and nitrogen oxides, then we make extra ozone. And this really extra ozone is a pollutant. Okay. Uh, it can damage plants, vegetation, it can irritate the respiratory tract and cause people with asthma to have more respiratory problems. So it is a health issue at ground level and over the last 50 years we've certainly seen an increase in tropospheric ozone, the lower part of the atmosphere. main bulk of the ozone in the atmosphere is in the stratosphere and that's between about 15 and 40 kilometers above our heads. 90% of the ozone is there and the key role that it plays is to absorb ultraviolet radiation from the sun. What do we know about it? Well we know that there has been over the last 30 or 40 years decrease in ozone and that every year, and we see it in newspapers and and in the media reports, every year now, we said that there's an ozone hole over the Antarctic region. Okay? So in this lecture, we're really going to focus on stratospheric ozone. We'll talk about ozone chemistry. We'll talk about the ozone hole and the state of play as we know it today. Got some little movies here that show ozone formation and destruction. Here is ozone formation. O2 is broken down by light to give us an oxygen atom, which couples with another molecule of oxygen to give you O3. So that is the key step here. The light is ultraviolet radiation, quite energetic, less than 200 nanometers. It's really quite strong radiation. We get two oxygen atoms, obviously, and then each oxygen atom reacts with a molecule of O2 to give you ozone. So the net result is that we have three molecules of oxygen to give you two molecules of ozone. That's the formation. Now, if we had just that reaction only, then all the oxygen would be converted to ozone, right? That doesn't happen. So what happens is that we have another step which actually gets rid of ozone. And along the way, some very important things happen. What we have is ozone absorbing light, and notice the color 
here is different okay ozone is broken up and the oxygen atom is generated but it recouples again so let's see it, it, it re reforms ozone so ozone absorbs light at slightly longer wavelengths but still in the ultraviolet to give us O2 plus O and then what happens is that this oxygen atom then can recombine with O2 to give us ozone or in fact it can react with ozone to be destroyed uh, and to give us oxygen so that is the reverse of that reaction so the net result is that we have no overall change but we do have ozone being formed in what we call a steady state okay so it's being formed and destroyed and on average there's a balance in the atmosphere and this is natural chemistry that is occurring and this was discovered really through laboratory experiments in the 1930s Sidney Chapman proposed four reactions this is the oxygen only chemistry cycle um, to describe the formation and destruction of ozone in the atmosphere and so that's the first reaction this is the initiation step where O2 is photolyzed oxygen atoms then react with O2 to give us ozone and ozone absorbs light and so this actually goes back and forth this is just like a cycling reaction and eventually that reaction can come to an end by ozone reacting with O atoms to give us molecular oxygen so it's a cycle okay a couple of key things here we're absorbing ultraviolet light in this region we're also absorbing ultraviolet light in this region and we need to have collisions of newly excited ozone molecules with a third body with another molecule of air that's, that's what M means it could be nitrogen or oxygen and the reason is that once you start to add oxygen atoms to oxygen molecules we start to form a new chemical bond which has lots of energy immediately there's lots of energy there due to bond formation and it can simply fall apart however if that excited newly formed ozone molecule immediately collides with another gas molecule it can transfer the energy and then it becomes stable and the energy is transferred to the atmosphere and in a way because this reaction is exothermic that means that we generate heat okay. so that's very important because that step of generating heat helps us to explain the temperature increase that we measure in the stratosphere here is a temperature here is a, is a profile of temperature in the atmosphere and what it shows is that we have as you expect from ground level as we go up to about 10 kilometers or so the temperature decreases almost linearly actually and then from there on it starts to increase and this increase above our heads 10 to 30 or 40 kilometers is actually due to the heat generated from that chemical reaction here okay so that's the reason why we have a uh, difference in different layers of the atmosphere because we have this temporal profile which redefines our different regions so this is where all the chemistry is going on at that point above 10 20 30 kilometers you can see here the number of air molecules the pressure is really considerably less than it is at ground level if you go right to the very very top of the atmosphere even up here there's very few gas molecules at all and so the result is that at the very very top of the atmosphere we might well be able to make oxygen atoms and in principle form ozone but they're looking for gas molecules to collide with but there's insufficient number of gas molecules to collide with at the very top because the pressure is so small the result is that we don't get ozone formation at the very top that only really starts to kick in at about 40 kilometers or so and as we're coming down the pressure gets better okay there's more molecules of air and eventually we're going to get much more ozone formation why do we get an ozone layer obviously what happens is that as we come down from the top more and more of the UV light is filtered out oxygen absorbs ozone absorbs and eventually all of that UV light that is essential for forming the oxygen atoms to that very first initial step has been filtered out so below about 15 kilometers all that is gone and so that's where we have an ozone layer a combination of those two factors and when we look at it this is the ozone layer now this is expressed in a concentration which we're going to call a mixing ratio and it's the number of parts per million of ozone molecules per parts per million uh, 
ribosa molecules uh, per million molecules of air. And what this shows is that even at the highest concentration, which is about 30 kilometers here in the ozone layer, there are only eight ozone molecules in a million molecules of air. Very, very small concentration. Very tiny. And so that's the relative concentration of ozone, and it really shows the existence of the ozone layer. If you look at it a different way, though, you'll see the actual absolute concentration of ozone. It's not so clear. What it shows is that we also have a fair bit of ground, uh, ozone at ground level. In fact, the absolute concentration is 10 to the 12 molecule per centimeter cubed. Um, and that is not so different up in the stratosphere. But the key difference, of course, is that there's a lot less air in the stratosphere, and so the relative concentration is much higher, even if the absolute concentration is quite similar. So we typically talk about things and gases and trace gases, and John will talk about this in climate change as well, in terms of a parts per million or a relative abundance. When we first started measuring ozone in the 1920s, uh, it was using the Dobson spectrometer. This is the original one, which is in a science museum, I think, in London. And what it does is it measures UV radiation from the sun at different wavelengths. And looks at the ratio of those wavelengths, takes into account the absorption by ozone itself, and therefore we can estimate a total concentration of ozone in the atmosphere. But if you think about it, if you think that the, the sun is your light source, and this is your detector, the atmosphere is your absorbing medium, what we've got is that you're only therefore measuring a total amount of ozone in a column between the ground and the sun. And so that really is the atmosphere. And so it gives us a total column ozone concentration. And the units we use to describe that are called Dobson units. Uh, here's the definition. It basically, if we take all of the ozone that is in the Earth's atmosphere and compress it down to zero degrees centigrade and one atmosphere pressure, then all of the Earth's ozone would be a layer three millimeters thick. That's how little ozone there actually is present. And that layer is, by definition, we define that as, as 300 Dobson units. Okay, so we're gonna talk typically about ozone concentration in a total column being about 300 Dobson units. This is important when we talk about the ozone hole later on. We still carry on with uh, some ground-based measurements of, of, of ozone, using the sun as a source of light. But obviously, we now have far more uh, variety of measurement possibilities with satellites and so on. And in fact, the total ozone mapping spectrometer, which was used throughout the 80s and 90s, I think it was put into retirement in 2006, was very important in establishing um, the ozone hole and its activity. Uh, this has since been replaced by the ozone monitoring instrument, but basically these are satellites that work in outer space, they're continuously measuring not just ozone, but many properties of the atmosphere. And what they do is they, they, they measure the difference in incoming sun, so if you imagine the sun, it's some kind of detector here, but the sun also goes to the earth, and there's some backscattering of light, that backscattering radiation is also received by the satellite. And there's some ratio of these two measurements that is used to drive a total column ozone concentration in Dobson units. And this is the sort of information that you can get here. Remember I talked about 300 Dobson units, that's green here, has been about typical. You can see a lot, of, a lot of the earth here is kind of green and yellow. So this in this 300, 350 Dobson unit range. Here is light blue, that's slightly lower, just 250. And there's some red areas with this higher amounts of ozone. Um, very localized, okay? You probably will be even able to see some ozone as pollution because of that. You can see that over Europe and, 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 and maybe over China here. All right. That's not everything, though. That's just a total column ozone. We want to know where the ozone is in the atmosphere. And to do that, we use a normal weather balloon and attach a very um, simple device uh, to it, and this is called an ozone sonde. 
so it's basically a polystyrene box containing an electrochemical cell. so there's a bit of chemistry in here and and this electrochemical cell contains potassium iodide, reacts with ozone to give you iodine and we have a, a potential difference here and iodine uh, becomes converted to iodide through taking up electrical current and this current is proportional to ozone so this is calibrated immediately before it's attached to a balloon and then it's sent up. Okay. This is the sort of profile that you get. You can see here ozone is in the blue at ground level. This is ozone in millipascals. This is basically parts per billion as a ratio of the atmospheric pressure, parts per billion. We have 40 parts per billion here and the ozone isn't actually present in the troposphere. As soon as we get to about 10 kilometers, you'll notice here the red line is the temperature. The temperature actually starts to have a temperature reversion, we enter the stratosphere and the amount of ozone starts to increase and this is the ozone layer. It's peaking here about 15 to 20 kilometers. I think this is um, uh, over the Arctic region um, during winter months. <clears throat> you can also see here there's water vapor and you can see that there's some water vapor present at ground level. We go through a cloud here, this green peak then it falls away. There's very little water vapour in the stratosphere, although there is still some present, but it's, it's, it's very minute levels. Okay. We were down in Valencia Observatory, Met Air and Run uh, weather station down in Kerry, and we were down there in March to watch an ozone sonde ascent. So we still do measurements across the world, and Ireland contributes once a month, I think, or well, during, during the winter months, we still do a weekly ascents from, from, from Valencia. But Aaron takes control of this. And this is an ascent that we filmed when we were down in... Um, when we were down in Kerry. I don't know what that is. Okay. So this is actually in Castle V, that's where the Metair and Valencia Observatory is. That's me, that's John. And so this is a kind of a typical weather balloon with the box, the ozone sun box. You can see that it's being carried there. Remember that little red red flag? Okay, so up it goes. Every 10 seconds it takes a measurement, okay? It takes in um, it takes in air and um, I'm gonna get rid of this because it will start automatically. Right. It takes in air and it measures ozone. It also measures temperature, pressure, humidity. And every 10 seconds, a signal is sent back down to a trans uh, to, to a receiver in the weather station. So you can actually see it on your screen as the balloon is going up. Okay. I mentioned that little red. Parachute, as you know, eventually the balloon will go up and 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 up. Eventually, pressure and temperature will win out. Basically, there's a lot lower pressure, and the balloon will explode, and um, it will come to ground level. This is a fairly heavy box that's cased in polystyrene, and the little red thing is a parachute. So it gently floats down to earth, and hopefully lands in the farmer's field or something, and, and doesn't do any damage to anybody. Um, 50 euro reward if you find this box and send it back to Met Aaron. So look out for it if you're out in the fields. A lot of them end up in Cork, Kerry, sometimes Limerick, and uh, it would even went to Wales at one point. Very windy conditions. <clears throat> so I'm just going to talk briefly about the importance of the ozone layer and why we do monitor it. And we need to know some basics first of all, okay, because it's very important to link it back to what we know about the electromagnetic spectrum and visible ultraviolet light in particular and remember that ultraviolet light is split into three regions UVA which is 400 down to 315 UVB which is 315 down to 280 nanometers and below 280 nanometers down to 100 that's UVC obviously down this end we have x-rays and so on this end we have visible light infrared microwaves radio waves etc the important thing to remember is that wavelength increases to the right, energy increases to the left. So the longer wavelengths have less energy. So the most energetic radiation really is ultraviolet, then X-ray and so on. 
and this is important for understanding the emission profile from the sun we see here we have a few graphs what we have first of all is the yellow the yellow shows us the actual emission from the sun at the top of the atmosphere so if you're on that satellite you measure the emission profile the emission profile extends from microwaves infrared through the visible and into the UV even down to about 100 nanometers or so so the Sun emits radiation across a whole range of wavelengths and it's like a black body operating at way over 5,000 degrees okay, it's about 5,500 Kelvin or so and that curve is basically a model assuming that the Sun is a black body and it fits very well when we look at the real uh, emission of sunlight, not the real emission, but the, the sunlight that we receive at ground level or at sea level, that's the red curve. And what we see is that the sun, that the sun's emission is actually absorbed at certain points. That's very clear. So here and here and here. So incoming radiation, John's going to talk about absorption of infrared radiation as well in terms of climate change, but here we have some incoming radiation that's been absorbed by CO2 and water. We have some absorption or scattering of light in the visible and there's a notable dif difference in the UV whereby we can see that a fair amount of this radiation in the ultraviolet is actually absorbed. And that is really due to the chemistry that we talked about early on which is the absorption of UV light by oxygen and ozone. If you go into the lab we put oxygen on its own in a cell in a UV absorption spectrometer we can measure this absorption spectrum and it absorbs between 130 and about 170 here if we extend that the signal goes down much much lower but it's important because it's still sunlight that we're absorbing and it goes up to about 205 210 nanometers so that's very energetic uv radiation absorbed by o2 if we look at ozone and ozone really only starts to absorb about 220 nanometers it peaks at about 250 or 260 nanometers and tails off at 300 but even extends really up to about 320 nanometers 330 nanometers or so and so between oxygen and ozone they cover virtually all of the uv absorption from the sun and so this really is our natural filter going back to uv a b and c all of the uv c radiation is absorbed this is radiation less than 280 nanometers and this is really important why because well 280 nanometers and less has sufficient energy to break carbon carbon bonds to break molecules like dna so if it wasn't for the fact that we have oxygen and ozone absorbing this high energy radiation we wouldn't be here at all it's very simple as that uvb radiation which is the one in the middle here between 280 and 315 well that's the that, that's the range that can give you a sunburn all right um, but also makes vitamin d so it is useful for us okay uh, and uvc is beyond 350 and up to 400 nanometers um, and i picked this up from some kind of american website that was trying to educate people and they called them dangerous rays burning rays and tanning rays okay looking at it in a slightly different way here is the energy from the sun at the top of the atmosphere here is the energy from the sun that we receive at the surface of the earth and you can see there's a little bit of um, absorption or scattering of the light anyway in the UV A region when we go to UV B you can see the effect of ozone is really really impressive you can see that it immediately tails off and so that wavelengths longer than 290 nanometers Are only getting through to the surface of the earth so the net effect is that harmful UV radiation is filtered out by the atmosphere we still have some UVB a fair bit of the UVA maybe 50% depending on cloud clouds can absorb and scatter some of this light as well um, but luckily all of that very high energy radiation is, is absorbed which takes us on to ways in which we can change that ways which we can change that is by our activities and the use of certain chemicals chlorofluorocarbons are obviously the famous ones in this respect 
And so they're basically a group of chemicals that only contain chlorine, fluorine and carbon. They don't contain hydrogen. That's the key thing. Carbon, three chlorines and fluorine. This is one of the most famous um, CFC molecules. This is CFC 11 or Freon 11. DuPont, the manufacturer of many of these chemicals, had the trade name of Freon for them. And they developed in the 1920s and 30s as alternative refrigerants to ammonia and sulfur dioxide, etc. Refrigeration in those days was a very messy business. It was developing, and people were starting to have these things in their home. <clears throat> but they used things like ammonia and sulfur dioxide, and leakage of these things wasn't only just smelling, it was also dangerous to the health. So these were seen as a very good replacement because they're chemically inert. Carbon fluorine bonds, we know, are really quite, quite strong. They're non toxic. You could breathe them in. They're odor free, they don't smell. They're easy to manufacture and they're inexpensive. So, overall, there's everything going for them, right? They're like dream chemicals. Industry wants to produce them and mass market them, and they did. And through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, they become used worldwide. There were thousands of tons of these materials produced, used, and emitted into the atmosphere from the 50s onwards, 50s, 60s, 70s. And by the 1970s, they were used worldwide in fridges, air conditioning, and especially spray cans. In 1974, there was a very important publication that appeared in the journal Nature, and it was based upon an idea by Sherry Rowland and Mario Molina. They were influenced by some measurements from Jim Lovelock, who was measuring molecules called CFCs in the atmosphere. And he showed that the amount of CFCs in the atmosphere was very consistent with what you might expect if nothing happened to them. And so these guys went to the lab, did some measurements, and they looked at CFCs. And the results of the work were this. Chlorofluoromethane CFCs are being added to the atm atmosphere in steadily increasing amounts. These compounds are chemically inert and may remain in the atmosphere for 40 to 150 years. So no one had ever really appreciated that these things could last so long. We're talking 100 years for some of these chemicals. And the concentration can be expected to reach 10 to 30 times the present levels. So based upon the amounts that were being made and emitted to the atmosphere, they're expecting the amount of CFCs to be multiplied by 30 times. Photo dissociation, so that is dissociation initiated by photons, breaking down by sunlight in the stratosphere produces significant amounts of chlorine atoms and this could lead to the destruction of atmospheric ozone. And the result, their hypothesis was this, is that CFCs are broken down by UV light but not the UV light that is present down at ground level in the troposphere, it's present in the stratosphere. You need energetic UV radiation, you need UVC radiation less than about 250 nanometers and that is only present in the stratosphere. So these compounds are chemically inert, they can drift eventually up to the stratosphere after being emitted, maybe 5, 10, 15 years, and eventually they're slowly broken down by UV light, and UV light will break the weakest bond. So in the chlorofluorocarbon, we have carbon-chlorine bond being the weakest, and so we have the production of a chlorine atom here. It's felt like a radical, really. And either of the CFCs could do this, the chlorine atom then would react with ozone. Just like O atoms react with ozone, chlorine can do exactly the same thing. Whereas O atoms would take an ozone and give you O2, chlorine takes an O from here to give you chlorine monoxide, ClO, just like carbon monoxide but chlorine, and a molecule of, a molecule of oxygen. This is a very reactive species as well, and it could react with oxygen atoms to regenerate chlorine and O2. So the result of this process is that we have ozone depletion. Importantly, chlorine is there at the start and chlorine is there at the end. And the same chlorine atom can go back again and to show another ozone molecule. So this is almost like a, a doomsday scenario, is that in principle, chlorine could destroy all of the ozone in the stratosphere. Now, they knew that CFCs would be emitted, were CFCs really measured in the atmosphere? Well, not really at that stage. And so this was a hypothesis that needed to be tested. 
that needed to be measured but of course the implications are huge if we're destroying our ozone what's the main implication well the main implication is that we're going to get a lot more uv light and we know if we have a lot more uv light then we're going to get things like skin cancer okay and you can see here there's a there's an early form of skin cancer on on an earlobe and this if it's untreated can lead to something a lot more serious called a malignant melanoma and that's just a cartoon picture here's a real one quite advanced stage okay looks a bit like the blackberry jam I had in my toast this morning yeah so uh, obviously this is not a desirable thing we do not want to destroy our ozone and have a lot more UV light not only will it give us skin cancer it can cause damage to the eyes form cataracts it can affect the immune system it can reduce phytoplankton it doesn't just affect us it affects ecosystems planet vegetation and in fact as we now know from measurements in the Antarctic we can see that there has been damage to DNA in various life forms when the ozone hole is present so the impact is clear it's a very damaging situation and um, we need to do something about it so 1974 was the hypothesis um, and this really caused people to sit up and act and action was taking place so the easiest thing to do was to ban CFCs and spray cans and this was done in the US then Canada nor in Sweden very early on but no other countries decided to follow suit um, there was industry lobbying to say well there's no evidence to show that there is any damage to the ozone layer at all there weren't sufficient measurements in place during those days and so CFCs continue to be used as refrigerants and solvents. So they weren't really adopting the precautionary principle, which is that, well, it could, it could be really bad. Don't we think we should just ban them anyway? They, they ignored that, and, and, and the, industry, the industry lobby won out. What about this fear that we could completely destroy the ozone layer? Well, people were doing lots more experiments in the labs. Okay, a lot of this information that we know about ozone is really not done by going there and measuring it we're simulating the conditions and doing experiments in the laboratory under conditions that are relevant for temperature and pressure so they're quite challenging experiments but what we found out people found out really I was only a child at the time but chlorine doesn't keep on going and destroying ozone forever it reacts with a few other things in fact it reacts with methane which is present in very small amounts in the stratosphere because it's a long-lived gas also it's a greenhouse gas, as John Sodder will explain, but very small amounts of it get up to the stratosphere and chlorine reacts with methane to give you hydrochloride. The CLO radicals that are produced in this chlorine chemistry that destroys ozone, the Clox cycle as it's called, or well, the CLO atoms actually react with NO2. Trace amounts of that is also present in the stratosphere, very low amounts, but it's sufficient to mop up chlorine monoxide and that will give us a molecule called chlorine nitrate and it turns out both of these molecules are actually quite stable in the atmosphere even in the stratosphere they don't really get broken down by that hard UV radiation if they were made in ground level here they would dissolve in water they would react with um, clouds or something but there's insufficient clouds normally in the dry stratosphere and so these are stable reservoir compounds for chlorine and all the chlorine really ends up in these species so the result is that chlorine doesn't go on forever and destroy all the ozone it may only destroy about a thousand or ten thousand ozone molecules that's still significant right it's still a very effective catalyst and eventually this stops luckily for us <clears throat> what about CFCs well let's try to measure them using gas chromatography this was done very efficiently and here what you can see is CFCs their volume mixing ratio it's tiny it's parts not even parts per million not parts per billion but parts per trillion all right so the amount of CFCs is actually a million times less than even the amount of ozone it's tiny it's a very very small amounts we can see that their concentration this is starting here at about five kilometers is very stable okay and it tails off so what it, this, these concentration profiles going up to about 30, 40 kilometers means that CFCs are in the stratosphere. We finally worked that out. So CFCs are in the stratosphere and they are 
concentrations are tailing off, meaning that surely they must be being destroyed. We didn't go there and actually measure the chemistry taking place at this point, but this shows that CFCs are there and their profiles are consistent with them destroying ozone. But it wasn't exactly proof until in the 1980s the Antarctic ozone hole was discovered. All right, so, and nobody was expecting this. So the British Antarctic Survey had for at least 20 years at this point been making measurements in Halley Bay in Antarctica. And lots of these were fundamental scientific measurements because Antarctica is a pristine environment, right? It's so far away from anything else. It's a perfect place to study ecosystems or find out things about our planet. And one of the things they were doing was regularly measuring ozone, just as a routine thing, using ground-based instruments and also ozone sons, ozone balloons. And they were doing this regularly every week throughout 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and the 1980s, Joe Farman, this guy here, who, who was doing a lot of the work, made an amazing discovery. And the discovery was that we have a huge depletion of ozone over Antarctica. And when they went back and analyzed all the data in detail, I mean, it really was more or less a one-man band, I think, to be honest. So we didn't have necessarily all the time to analyze all the data. But what we see here, this is the ozone con concentration in Dobson units. This is the total column ozone over Antarctica going back from 1960s to 1970s, and we can start to see a decline through the 1970s through the 1980s. All right, so the measurements really were made here using a combination of ground-based Dobson spectrometer type measurements and also balloon ascents. And of course, we now have a better database that extends through, and we can see that the ozone uh, depletion has really uh, accelerated through the 70s, 80s, and the 90s. And this is in line with increase in CFC concentrations. And believe it or not, this was found out before NASA found it out as well, because NASA, since the 1970s, designed this total ozone mapping spectrometer. And they were investigating uh, this in exceptional detail and with their satellite measurements, but they didn't see it. It's only when this was reported they checked all the data, and what they found was this, is they found that they'd had some computer code that had been written, and routinely in those days, especially if instruments aren't perfect, and this was a developmental instrument, then if you got some kind of rogue values, some exceptionally high or low numbers, then those numbers were actually kicked out and were analyzed. And so those numbers had been programmed to be kicked out. So the very low con concentration of ozone that had been measured was actually rejected by the computer measurement program, uh, and they didn't see it, but only when they reanalyzed the whole data, then they could see it. There's a lesson in there for us. And here are some detailed profiles uh, over Antarctica that are performed in the mid 1980s. And we can, it's very important to look at the times of the year here. Okay, so we have an ozone profile going from ground level through to um, about. Well, this is a partial pressure here, but this is going up to altitudes of about 30 kilometers, all right? And we can see that we have ozone kicking in about here. Look at the August 1986 profile. This is important to look at first. August, we can see the ozone layer start to show us here. And most of the ozone is at an altitude of about 15 kilometers. And the same is true for 1987 here in late August. This is a time when it's summer here, but winter over Antarctica, all right? So there's no sunlight. It's 24 hours of darkness. And that's important to remember. When we come back two months later to October, what we see is a huge depletion of ozone, very dramatic. And so this is really, this is a, a big dent, if not a hole in the ozone, and that's really why it's called the ozone hole. And it really only appeared in September, fully formed in October. You come back again in March, there's no hole. So the ozone hole is a very sudden, dramatic depletion of ozone, a loss of more than 50% or so, sometimes up to 75%, and it can occur over a period of weeks, and it's occurred at an altitude of about 15 kilometers. The area of the hole, the extent of it, was pretty much over the whole of Antarctica, 
and this is pretty much the size of North America as well, so it's huge. It's a very significant portion of our planet's surface. Surely, this is a very dramatic finding, and this must be related to chemistry of CFCs. And finally, some evidence was found. The smoking gun, as it's called, um, was discovered through a flight. So NASA took an ER-2 plane, loaded it with instruments, including spectrometers and so on, and what they decided to do in 1987 was to do an experiment. They wanted to do an experiment whereby uh, in September, with the start of the ozone hole was appearing, they would fly into it. So here we have a plot of ozone and we have a plot of chlorine monoxide, CLO. That's involved in the chlorine-initiated destruction of ozone. And we're flying over the ocean, and at this point here, we start to go over the landmass of Antarctica. And you see the ozone drop in a very kind of significant way, in a very unique pattern. And what you see for chlorine monoxide is the exact opposite. An amazing anti-correlation. So this is clear evidence that somehow chlorine is responsible for the destruction of ozone in the ozone hole. And this was obtained in September 1987. At exactly the same time, in fact, that 36 or representatives from 36 countries were meeting in Montreal to discuss a global or near global ban, a treaty anyway, an international treaty uh, for phasing out CFCs. And this protocol was signed on the 16th of September 1987. And it's the first international treaty to save the environment, to protect the environment. So it's very significant. 36 countries, and the initial goal was to reduce CFCs by only 35% by 2020. So this was a easy as she goes approach, okay? They were just um, making some commitment, but not anything too drastic. This was to become effective on the 1st of January 1989. But very quickly, people making measurements and also doing model calculations now, people started to model the chemistry in the stratosphere, found out that this wouldn't be sufficient. And so what we had over the years, we've had various revisions that have, in fact, now led to the complete phase out of CFCs and other compounds containing chlorine and bromine, as it happens, that can destroy ozone. And currently, virtually all the countries in the world are committed to phasing out, phasing out um, CFCs and other species which give up, uh, which, which destroy ozone. And you can see the impact of that. Here you have a plot from um, of, of CFC production, CFC production. Okay, kicking in really in the 1950s, accelerating rapidly through the 1970s, stabilizing a bit from 1974 because of the concerns. Right, so industry was adjusting a little bit, and then uh, they said, oh well, there's no ozone hole or anything, there. And, and then it, it ramped up again, and eventually an onshore protocol kicked in, and then a huge drop in CFC production and emission. And you can see that's very, very apparent. Even by about 1997 or so, the levels have gone back down to about 1950s production levels. So there's huge thousands of tons of these things uh, being manufactured and emitted. And so there's a drastic change. It really did, it really did a, uh, make a huge difference. But we still have refrigerators, we still have air conditioning, we still have spray cans, so we had to replace them. Uh, and people had been working on them in the meantime. The key thing that we had to have was that the CFCs had to have very similar physical properties to be used as refrigerants, maybe even drop-in replacements, you had to use the same kind of technology that was currently in place for refrigeration and air conditioning. And so basically, there must be very similar in chemical properties, and the first phase replacements were called hydrochlorofluorocarbons, HCFCs. They're pretty similar. The difference is that they have some hydrogen in their structure, as you can see for this example here. And so now we're introducing hydrogen into the molecular structure. What does this mean? Well, people know about the chemistry in the troposphere. So the lower atmosphere, where these would be emitted, at ground level, these actually can react in the atmosphere. They specifically react with hydroxyl radicals, and so they can get broken down. And what you can see here is a whole range of HCFCs that are being used as replacements. 
you'll see that their lifetimes are not a hundred years or so, their lifetimes are more like maybe a year or a few years. And their ozone depletion potential actually is very, very low. If CFCs are a one, by reference, these are actually only 0.1, so they're 10% of the ozone depletion of CFCs. Because they still contain chlorine, some of them can still get up to the stratosphere, especially this guy here, which has a lifetime of about 10 years. Okay. So the bottom line is that these were only ever seen as interim replacements. And the longer term replacements actually contain no chlorine at all, which are HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons, and here is one molecule here, which is now used in a lot of refrigeration. And so these are ones that are being used all the time. Let's return to the ozone hole story, because we, we still hear about it, and it's still going on, and in fact in the 1990s it still was the major environmental issue. Record ozone hole threatens Earth. And we still have an international day for the preservation of the ozone layer, which is on September the 16th, to mark the Montreal Protocol. If you were to pick up an even herald, you might see an article like this. Rather than record ozone hole, you might see the hole in our sky, almost kind of encouraging you to get on the beach and take advantage of these extra UV rays that are coming through. Um, that's the herald for you. This is the examiner. Hole in the ozone layer balloons to three times the size of America. Okay, so this is the world's largest ever ozone hole, Malen uh, Monster Millennium Ozone Hole, as you can see here. And throughout the 80s and the 90s, continuous monitoring of the ozone layer showed that we have an ozone hole. This is the, the purple spot over Antarctica where concentrations every year were going down as low as about 100 Dobson units. The question is still needed to be answered though, why is the depletion only over the Antarctic? Why aren't we seeing depletion of, CF, depletion of ozone all over the planet? And it turns out to be a combination of weather and chemistry. And the weather is the unique meteorology that we get over Antarctica, and it's the creation of a polar vortex. During the winter months, there's no sunlight, it's very dark, you get a very cold air mass which descends over Antarctica. And we get this vortex, this almost column of air, which doesn't interact with the air around it. And it gets very, very cold. And the temperatures can be as low as 180 Kelvin. That's almost well, it's minus 9 degrees centigrade. And under these conditions, we know that we can get very small ice particles being formed called polar stratospheric clouds. And they produce amazing images. Here they are over Norway. And here they are here, these white clouds at high altitude here above the, um, above the sunset. And these were regularly observed. Physicists and meteorologists knew these were present over Antarctica and also over the Arctic as well. And what we eventually found out through a combination of laboratory experiments and measurements in the atmosphere as well is this, is that during the winter darkness, which is really through our summer, June, July, August, we have the formation of these polar stratospheric clouds. The vortex is present, we have ice particles, we have condensation um, of material and growth of micron-sized ice particles, and these chlorine reservoirs that I talked about earlier on, like HCl, chlorine nitrate, well, they're chemically non-reactive, right? But they stick to the surface of these ice particles. And it turns out that we get some heterogeneous chemical reactions, these gas, surface reactions kick out other chlorinated species. HCl and chlorinitrate reacting with an ice particle becomes chlorine and HOCl. And these species can be broken down very easily by sunlight. Now it's still dark, right? So the concentration of these things builds up. When you get to this spring over Antarctica, which starts in September, you then start to get this very rapid uh, production of chlorine atoms and a very rapid destruction of ozone through the clock cycle. And that's the ozone hole chemistry. This peaks in October, we have the large amount of depletion. Eventually the temperatures start to rise, the polar stratospheric clouds disappear, the vortex breaks down, and it all dissipates. And so it's only really for a few months of the year that this is going on. And things return to normal. That's the situation in Antarctica. What is it like over the Arctic? very cold air as well. 
and we do see polar stratospheric clouds but we don't see very much ozone depletion so this is over um, the very north of Finland we see only about 10 or 20 percent depletion and the reason is the polar vortex is nowhere near as stable we only get maybe 10 or 20 percent of the ozone depletion the vortex forms and breaks up it's because the Arctic is a lot smaller than Antarctica and it's closer to other continents and other land masses and the temperatures do, do not get low enough to form enough of these polar stratospheric clouds. What is the ozone hole like now? Well, there are many resources to find out. In fact, you can get a live update of the ozone hole if you wanted to. Uh, this is an ozone hole formation through 2009. Here it is now in September and getting worse and worse and worse through October over all of Antarctica as you can see eventually maybe even going up to towards South America, the very tip of South America here as you can see right there. Right? And then by December it starts to recover pretty much. So the ozone depletion is only really for two or three months of the year. I can't close that quickly. What about the rest of the world? Well, the chlorine initiated chemistry from CFCs is not just over the ozone hole, over the Antarctica, right? Or even the Arctic. It's actually occurred all over the world, all over the planet. Uh, and we do see a trend where we have ozone depletion taking place very gradually. And we have lost a small amount of ozone through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and to date. Uh, and maybe 5% per decade has been lost. Okay, so we have lost ozone and there is more UV light that is coming through, especially in certain parts of the planet. And we will get some good news reports. Finally, the status is that there is evidence that the ozone hole is getting better. It's not as big as it used to be. Um, the amount of chlorine in the stratosphere is actually starting to decrease. And that maybe by 2050, we might return to a situation as normal but we still need to keep on monitoring it. So, it is a, a good news story. Roland and Molina and, and, and Paul Crutzen won a Nobel Prize for this in 1995. It's a, a science success story in a way because we've discovered a problem and we fixed it through international efforts. And this really um, was reward for these people who played a key part in that. And what it shows is I think that it was very timely intervention, and this is relevant really for climate change issue, which is with us at the moment, the very timely intervention that made all the difference. And the involvement of everybody, truly global treaty that offers protection to every single human being. So that's the final take home message from the Ozone whole story. And there are some links which will be available for you on the download which you can use um, for, your, for your teaching as well. Okay, so thank you.